So John chapter 3, verse 36. And you'll find that on page 944 of your pew Bible. John 3, 36, 944. The one who believes in the Son has eternal life, but the one who rejects the Son will not see life. Instead, the wrath of God remains on him. This is the word of the Lord. Now, before we uh, open up God's word and think about this last box, let me pray for us. Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Uh, Thank you that uh, through it, uh, it gives life uh, and that we can know you through your word. Uh, Thank you that you reveal yourself through your word and ultimately you reveal yourself through Jesus Christ. Uh, Thank you for his life, death and resurrection for our sins, uh, all according to the scriptures. I thank you for uh, this series that we've had uh, and for this last last, ser- uh, last sermon um, where we get to think about the choice that we make before you. Amen. Uh, the date is September 1st, 1939. Events on this day have had repercussions for the last 85 years. Poland, who is outnumbered and taken by surprise, quickly fall to Nazi German invasion. Tensions have been brewing for years, but this date marks a change. In light of the situation, other European nations are forced to respond. They could do nothing and see what happens, see what unfolds, or make the choice to respond. On the 3rd of September, Britain and France declare war on Germany, and so begins World War II. A choice taken has impacted impacted history ever since. Maybe a less well-known event uh, took place in September 1983. Stanislav Petrov was a lieutenant in the Soviet Union Air Force. During an overnight shift, his computer registered five US missiles heading for the Soviet Union. Had he have just followed policy he should have immediately notified superiors and his country most likely would have retaliated. Instead, he thought something wasn't quite right. So he checked his computer computer, and confirmed that it was just malfunctioning. His action that day saved many lives. Now, often we are faced with a choice and it's how we respond that dictates how uh, we live There are times throughout history where a decisive choice has had a significant impact on both individuals and nations. Over the past five weeks, we've been looking at the foundations of the gospel, the good news of who Jesus is, how the good creation that we heard in the kids' talk uh, that God made was broken by human rebellion, how that rebellion or sin leads to judgment and how the only way that we can be reconciled to God is through his son, who lived a perfect life, died in our place, and rose, confirming his place as ruler and judge. It's been a big five weeks, hasn't it? I think it's uh, stretched us in many ways and deepened our understanding as to why it's important to get the fundamentals of the gospel down pat. Because when we get to the end we see that the most decisive choice needs to be made. Uh, This week we are looking at the choice that the gospel calls for. To follow our old way of living or to follow God's new way. The Bible makes clear that you cannot be a a fence-sitter when it comes to choosing between God and our own way. I hope you picked up that in our verse this morning. Where am I pointing this, Seamus? There we go. Uh, The one who believes in the Son has eternal life, but the one who rejects the Son will not see life. Instead, the wrath of God remains on him. 
As humans, we are by nature sick. We are born with sin, and from birth we are in rebellion against God. And so in our current state, the gospel has a binary logic to it. It's in this sense that there are only two ways to live. Either keep living our own way against God or make a decisive change and start living God's way and following Jesus. So uh, this box is summarized in this way. Our way, reject God as ruler, live our own way, damaged by our rebellion, and facing death and judgment. Uh, The next, or the alternative is God's new way. Submit to Jesus as our ruler, rely on Jesus' death and resurrection, forgiven by God, and receive a new life that lasts forever. As we look at these two stark choices, uh, we'll look at them within uh, this framework, Uh, These three categories, which we'll unpack as we go. Uh, The choice is personal, the choice is practical, and the choice prepares us. Each of these categories touches on aspects of the choice we all must face, either accepting God's good plan and the way, and His way, or rejecting Him and going our own way. Uh, So firstly, the choice we all face is personal. Uh, there's a great movie in a great moment in the movie You've Got Mail. Uh, I wonder if you've seen that movie. That's uh, where Tom Hanks's character is giving advice to Meg Ryan's character. In regards to a business decision she has to make, Hanks tells her to fight, fight for your business, and finishes by saying, "Whenever you are feeling stuck or worried, remember this and say it to yourself: It's not personal; it's business." Ryan uh, tries this, but eventually her shop closes. Later in the movie, she tells Tom Hanks that her, for her, it wasn't just business. It was rather deeply personal. And it's much the same when we look at the choice between God's way and living our own way. The decision is personal. Uh, we've worked through six neat boxes that out, outline the gospel clearly, uh, But don't think that the choice at the end is a business choice, a business decision. It's not a tick the right box and she'll be right type of choice. It's personal because God is personal. The choice to follow God's way is not to follow a distant deity or an inanimate object, but rather a living being. God is in his nature relational and the gospel is personal. We've seen this throughout the whole series. We saw it in week one. God is the ruler and he is the maker of all things. He made us in his image to rule under him. So God created man in his own image. He created him in his image. He created them male and female. Their role was was meant to be an image bearer of God, to represent God in the world. God created many things, but the most personal of his creation was those that bear his image. Uh, The next week we saw that the personal nature of the decision comes to the front, looking at sin. We saw that sin is not just an accumulation of things that we've done wrong, where we've fallen off off the line a little bit, but rather it's a rejection of God and his rule. Uh, David said these words in Psalm 51, Against you, you alone, God, have I sinned and done evil in your sight. Sin is not just a rejection of a distant deity, but of our Creator who made us in His image to be His image bearer. Sin is a willful, relational rejection of God as ruler and creation as, and Creator. Sin is universal in its reach and comprehensive in its depth. The next week we saw that this sin leads to judgment. Rejection of God leads to judgment, as God won't let sin go unpunished, and he won't let us rebel forever. 
Now, Steve helped us to understand that God has judged, is judging, and will judge all people. God does not take delight in judging his creation, but he is holy and righteous, so he cannot let sin go unpunished. And we heard that from Hebrews, just as it is appointed for people to die once and after this face judgment. Uh, Over the last two weeks, we saw just how deeply God is invested in bringing his creation back to himself. So invested that after hundreds of years of messengers coming before him, he himself showed up. Jesus, God the Son, came to show people who God was. In a discussion with his disciples in uh, Mark 14, Jesus says that to have seen and know Jesus is to have seen and known the Father. God wants a relationship with his creation, for his creation to know and love him, because this is the best thing for them. God steps into the muck and brokenness of humanity in order to rescue us. We see his love for us ultimately in the work of Jesus on the cross. Jesus came to reveal God, to live, die and rise for our sins according to the scriptures so that the broken relationship between God and man could be restored. Now, people hearing the gospel and people responding positively, positively to the gospel is deeply personal to God. We are lost sheep. He is the good shepherd searching for us. And so when people continue to reject God, it is in that personal relationship that the rejection occurs. It's a decision each person must make. And so it's not enough for someone to have had Christian parents or Christian grandparents. Not enough to have been baptized as an infant and yet don't personally know Jesus. Uh, Jesus himself says that people will come to him and say, Lord, Lord, did we not do all this in your name? And Jesus turns them away and says, I didn't know you. Jesus says that whoever believes or the one who believes in the Son has eternal life, but the one who rejects the Son will not see life. It's not a decision someone can make for you, but a decision each person must make on their own. Uh, For the kids and young adults among us, this is something you will need to think through. Uh, That's why it's so wonderful uh, each Friday afternoon when we have around 50 kids coming to youth group to hear the good news of Jesus. Uh, It's wonderful when we have 40 kids turning up on a Sunday morning to hear about Jesus. So our choice is personal, but it is also practical. Now, following God's way is summarized in two key words, submit and reply, uh, rely. Now, so if you've read the Learn the Gospel book, uh, you, and the, in this chapter you'll have seen two key words, uh, that what it looks like to follow Jesus. It talks about repentance and faith. Following Jesus isn't an intellectual endeavor. Connected to the, per- the choice of being personal, believing in the Son is not a tick box. A person cannot claim to follow Jesus and yet not change the way they live. To submit and rely on Jesus is to change one's life and follow him. That's not enough to respond to the gospel by being merely sorry. To feel guilt about what you have done and how you have lived is not submitting or being repentant. Responding to the good news and showing true repentance means a change of mind and will that results in a change of action. It's stopping the way you are going and turning 180 degrees towards Jesus. Now, this is important because it's not just stopping the way you've previously lived and aiming to do better or aiming to to be better. At that point, we've just slid into thinking that we're working our way into God's good books. 
No, repentance is acknowledging our sin, an old way of life, and start submitting to God's good rule. We need to get the horse before the cart. Our actions spring from what God has done for us in Christ and what he is doing in our lives, not an action to earn God's favour. Uh, Likewise, we're called to rely upon or place our faith in Jesus. It's not enough to say that you merely have faith generally. Faith is grounded in the object of of that faith. That's why Jesus puts it this way. The one who believes in the Son has eternal life. Not the one who acknowledges he existed, or the one who thinks he was a really good teacher, but the one who believes in the Son. We depend upon Jesus as our source of life now and as our hope for uh, in death. Instead of trusting ourselves and our own works, we turn away from our rebellion and rely on Jesus. Our choice is is personal, it is practical, but it also prepares us. It's personal that God, in that God loves the world so much that he sent his own son to free the world from sin. And that rejection of the gospel message is a rejection of God himself. It's practical in that these actions follow the attitude. Or to put it another way, a person's practice must match their proclamation. When we put our faith in Jesus, God wonderfully doesn't leave us to do this on our own, but gives us the spirit to enable us to live for Jesus. So lastly, why is this decision important? Why is it crucial that when we share the gospel, and Jesus assumes that we are sharing the gospel, people understand the implications, because the choice prepares us for what's to come. Now, some may have heard of a man by the name of Frank Jenner. For the most part, he was a very unassuming man and someone who understood the implications of the gospel choice. After the trauma of World War I and the depression of the 30s, Jenner had hit rock bottom. And that's when he came to know Jesus as Lord and Saviour. Jenner sensed the urgency of people's standing before God so how uh, people are under God uh, and the urgency to share Jesus with people around him after the events of World War II. And so he began asking strangers, mostly military personnel and businessmen on George Street, Sydney, this simple question. He'd go up to them and ask, young man, if you were to die tonight, where would you be? Heaven or hell? Uh, It's roughly calculated that over the time he was doing that, he spoke to about 10,000 people. And there are multiple people who said it was because of him that they came to Christ. It's a simple yet stark question that cuts to the heart of this week's chapter. So I wonder perhaps if we could reframe the, the summary like this. Sorry, I don't have it up there for you. Uh, Our way, facing death and judgment that leads to hell. Or God's way, assurance and comfort when facing death and judgment, knowing we will receive a new life that lasts forever. Death and judgment are certainties, but it's how you or who you trust in that will dictate how uh, that happens. Now, I know that uh, additional thing is a bit wordy and perhaps it wouldn't fit nicely on a uh, Bible tract, but it captures the eternal nature of people's choice. Uh, I've met enough people who assume that they'll have plenty of time to make a decision about God. The great lie of this generation is that you do you. Seek your best life now. And so the question is raised... Why live God's way when I can live my own way now and change my mind 
when things get tough or when I'm getting to the end. It's straight out of an Isuzu MUX ad, isn't it? Go your own way. Worry about God things later. I suspect most people assume that tomorrow will be just the same as today. That tomorrow will always come. Now, the thing is that tomorrow may not come and time to make a decision may disappear very quickly. The gospel does, demands a decision, but it doesn't say how long a person may have to make that decision. For those sitting here this morning who have placed their trust in Jesus, brothers and sisters in the faith, you have made the best decision in the world. Now, there is no greater joy than following Jesus and no greater responsibility than to share the good news of Jesus with those who don't know. Many of our family and friends don't know Jesus. Most of our town don't know Jesus and yet, and are yet to hear the decision that they must make. I wonder who you could share the good news with this week and help them take one step closer to Jesus. For those here this morning who haven't asked God for forgiveness and haven't yet placed your faith in Jesus, there is no better time than today to come to Jesus. Uh, Ali and Steve uh, from the ministry team will be down the front at the end of the service uh, and would love to talk to you about how you can know Jesus more and if you're ready to ask Jesus to be your Lord and Saviour. Learn the Gospel. Uh, It's been a great uh, book to work through, a great resource to look at these past six weeks and to see that eventually you have to make a decision about the Gospel. In fact, the Gospel demands a decision. The slow build of the first five boxes of Learn the Gospel has brought us to this binary moment. On the one hand, you can persist in the attitude and action that says, I am God and God is not. And the consequence is facing the judgment of God, the judgment of death on your own merits. On the other hand, you can turn to Jesus, repent of your sin, trust in what he has done, his life, death and resurrection, and submit to his right and good rule and receive restoration with God forgiveness of sins and a completely new life. You eventually have to make a decision about the gospel.